Hello and welcome to NoCap Game Design. In this episode, I explore the second combat operation in Valkyria Chronicles, titled In Defense of Brule. One of the main points that I want to focus on in this episode is the level architecture and how the location of in-game assets helps to achieve target design goals. What are the design goals of this level and how does level architecture help to achieve them? Well, I'll talk about that in detail later. But for a quick sneak peek, the developers are able to change the difficulty of this level simply by moving around enemy units or other in-game assets. Additionally, this level features a tank, the first of its kind. How do the developers introduce it, and what lessons can be learned when you try to introduce a powerful new unit into your game? But before we get there, the combat operation begins as always with a brief overview of the level. The developers have outlined the map, the objective, and provide some advice on tactics, strategy, or sometimes both. Noteworthy here, the victory condition has changed from last time. Previously, it was simply kill all the enemies, but now the goal is to take out the enemy leader. The developers provide a rough location of where the enemy leader can be found, and that's all the info that the player gets. No tips on what the leader looks like or if they have any special powers. The player, for the most part, is going in blind. The developers repeat this new victory condition three times, one of which is a voice line spoken aloud. Focus on taking down their captain. They're really trying to reinforce to the player that the rules have changed from last time. This is good design. Whenever the rules or the situation changes, a good developer needs to make that clear to the user, especially in these early levels. Now, while the victory condition is to take out the leader, I think most casual players will kill all the other regular units anyways. To get to the leader, you have to work your way through the level, and the safest way to do that is by taking out all the other units. So even if the player doesn't get the message, there wouldn't be that much confusion or frustration. With the mission analysis out of the way, we can begin to discuss the level itself. This level was designed to make it clear to a player where to go and what to do. Notice, the level map is more or less a linear path, making it easy for a player to follow. I touched on this architectural technique in the last episode, so the new technique I want to discuss here is the placement of sandbags. In this game, sandbags provide substantial defensive bonuses to a player, not only by covering a majority of the hitbox, but also by making the character immune to critical hits. In this level specifically, the sandbags have been placed in a ladder formation, which allows a player to incrementally make progress one rung at a time. This seems to invite a player deeper into the town square, with each sandbag acting as a visible target, a goal for a player to achieve. The developers are setting up sandbags to be a signpost in this game. They ultimately become a medium strength signpost, but they do signal to a player to consider moving towards them in the later levels. Also, using sandbags here, as opposed to waypoints or something else, allows a player to stay safe, which lowers the difficulty of the level. This is good design, especially for level 2. To summarize, because I think this is an important point, the geometry of the level and the location of assets placed in the level are specially set up to achieve two main design goals. First, this is only level 2, so the level can't be difficult. The architecture should provide defensive bonuses to a new player who may make mistakes. And second, the level also can't be too complicated. A solution or plan needs to be fairly easy and obvious to a new player. The sandbags help to achieve both of these goals. Firstly, they make the level less difficult by providing defensive bonuses primarily to the player. Notice, the enemy units aren't always crouching and they're not very smart. And second, the ladder structure of the sandbags makes planning really easy for a player. It would be natural for a player to advance one sandbag at a time, which is both a simple plan to come up with and to execute. It's not just the sandbags that are acting as a pulling force for a player to move deeper in the level. As discussed in depth in the Halo series, enemy units are oftentimes the strongest pull force in a game, and the Valkyria Chronicles is no exception. Here, the developers trickle in enemy units, usually about one per turn, as the player slowly works their way up the ladder of sandbags. Some enemies are hidden around corners and lie in ambush, while others are scripted to sprint out and take a few pot shots at the player before retreating to safety. In this game, enemies are core to the gameplay. If there were no enemies, the player might get confused and become unsure of what to do. The developers do a good job here. There's always at least one enemy in view for the player to advance towards. But with this peekaboo play and possible ambushes, sightlines become an important concept for the player. So the devs have included a tutorial about them in this level. As I said in the previous episode, it's important to only introduce new rules as they become relevant. Simply put, because of the hidden enemies, sightlines have become relevant. The sightlines are these large golden hairs which connect the player character to visible enemy characters. A new player may walk right past a hidden enemy into an ambush and not immediately realize it. The sightlines make it clear that a character is in danger. 
this is a mechanic that the player needs to learn in order to succeed at this level, so the devs include a text tutorial about it. It's important for the player to know where the threats are. Where's a safe place to hide from enemy sight? And inversely, who can the player characters shoot at? These sightlines are a clear way to show the player where enemy targets are. This is very helpful because sometimes in this game, an enemy sniper can be small and well hidden, so it's not always obvious when the character is exposed or not. And again, to bring this back to level 2, a new player may not realize they've fallen into an ambush. The sightlines make it clear without overwhelming the UI. This is good design, conveying a lot of important information with minimal screen presence. Eventually, the player will work their way to the plaza and engage the enemy leader. How does the player know which unit is the leader? They're wearing bright red armor, of course. Now, this is a graphics design technique, but it is being leveraged to improve the game. If something is important or unique, then use a unique color to draw attention to it. It's such a powerful design rule, the developers didn't even feel the need to explain that the leader was the one in all red. A typical player will realize that the red one is special. I will note, when using colors to convey information, be careful. Some people are colorblind and will be unable to read that information. Good design is building a system that anyone can interact with. If you want to use color to convey information, which I strongly encourage, I think it's a good idea, then I also recommend that you should follow up with some kind of non-color marker. Notice, the enemy captain has a gold icon on the bottom right box, marking him as the leader. Regular units do not have this icon. Once the player defeats the enemy captain, the level ends. Or so we think. This is the halfway point of the level. The Empire rolls in a tank. The mood shifts. Things become desperate and the plan changes. The developers convey a lot of information in a short amount of time, simply by letting the tank play its turn. First, the tank runs over and destroys a series of sandbags. This is the first time the player learns that sandbags can be destroyed. They're a defensive tool that a tank can crush. Next, the tank launches a well-placed mortar round that takes out almost 90% of the watchman's health. Welkin is also caught in the blast, demonstrating the high firepower and area effectability of the tank. And finally, the whole squad is shooting the tank non-stop, but its health bar in the bottom right doesn't lose a single point of damage. It's impervious to small arms fire. It should be clear to most players, they've been set up to fail. There's no winning this mission. The tank is overwhelming. But just in case it wasn't clear, the devs follow up with dialogue between Alicia and Welkin talking about how the battle is now hopeless. That's not good. We're not equipped to take out a tank. There are some good game design lessons here. First, it's always better to show than tell. Demonstrate to the player in game some piece of information. And if you really need to drive home the point, then follow it up with explicit dialogue re-explaining what happened. Here, the information being conveyed is that the tank is too powerful for the three scout units to deal with, and the devs follow this up with a new mission. Welkin needs to escape. I'll note here, I got confused the first time that I played this level and attempted to escape with the town Watchmen. It didn't quite work, so perhaps the mission was a bit of a design mistake, or at least a failure to communicate. Or maybe I'm just dumb. What do you think? Let me know in the comments what the devs could have done better here, and if you're enjoying my sultry voice and want more, please consider subscribing. One last thought about this change in mission. From a storytelling perspective, this is risky. It's only level 2, and according to the plot, the player characters lose. They're outgunned and forced to retreat. Having the player lose level 2 is unusual, but I think the developers took a calculated risk and handled it well. This builds dramatic tension. Gallia is a small nation. The player will often be put in tough battles with the odds stacked against them, and it really showcases that the tank is a major game piece that is not to be underestimated. This is a storytelling risk, not a game design risk. But this is a story-based game, so I thought I'd mention it. The lesson here, if you want to build dramatic tension and introduce a new powerful unit, set up an encounter that the player will lose. It's risky, but it could add a powerful punch to your game's story and emotional texture. And the player will always remember that one unit that gave them their first loss. The back half of this level is actually surprisingly different from the first half. The biggest difference, well, there's a tank, and this severely limits the player's tactical options. Additionally, there are some sandbags, but they are not conveniently placed. There is no ladder providing easy cover. The player is just going to have to take a few hits and do their best to be quick. And the last big difference, there are now four enemy scout units plus a tank, all in view for the entire time. Previously, the developers trickled enemies in one at a time, but now the player is really outnumbered. Everything that I pointed out as being good design in the first half of the level, the developers seem to have done the exact opposite. But that's okay, this is not bad design. The level assets and architecture are still achieving the design goals, but the design goals have changed. 
Previously, the devs wanted to make the level easy, now they want to make it hard. Using the exact same resources, a couple of sandbags, and a few enemies, the developers have built a totally different play experience. Now there is a distinct sense of desperation and risk. The game challenge has suddenly spiked, and this matches the drama of the story. This is still good design. However, they are designing the encounter to be dramatic, desperate, and a little more challenging. Eventually, the player will get Welkin to escape, and the combat report clipboard appears. This time, there was an enemy leader, and we get a bonus reward, 250 EXP and DCT. Now, this isn't really a bonus, the player had to kill the leader in order to beat the level. It was required, but it does feel nice to get a bonus. The game design technique being used here is rewarding the player for doing things. Now, this seems trivial and obvious, but then again, design is the study of the obvious. If you want the player to play the game, then reward them for it. It feels good to get rewards, and especially in a mission that, according to the story, the player was forced to lose. Being outgunned by a tank and ending a level on a losing note like that is not ideal, but awarding an extra bonus to a player may make up for the perceived loss. In the next episode, Welkin strikes back with some heavy weaponry of his own. I'll see you there. Isara, we ready to roll? Engaging engine. The Edelweiss is ready for deployment. All right, Edelweiss. Move out!